Hey, what's up? This is Jordan Blackman, and you're listening to the Playmakers Podcast. On every episode, I interview a game industry expert, and I dive deep on their knowledge so that you learn something new. This week, we've got Mark Mencher, game industry recruiter extraordinaire, author of books including Get in the Game and Game Creation and Careers. If you want to know about breaking into the job that you want, if you want to know about how to manage your career, this is the guy who's going to help you get it done. We talk about all that and much more in this week's episode, so stay tuned. It's funny because at the top of the intro there, I didn't even mention what Mark's probably best known for, which is GameRecruiter.com. Mark is a fascinating guy. You don't meet too many recruiters that actually started in game development themselves as engineers that have the passion that Mark has for what he does and that have the insight, the knowledge and experience that he does. So we focus in this interview on the perspective of people managing their own careers in the industry. I know Mark would also be a fascinating guest to talk about uh, running a studio and hiring and all that. But we, we focus more on if you are on the other side of that. So we talk about, you know, how recruiting actually works. And if you've been contacted before and you're kind of curious how it's working on inside the recruitment experience and how they're being paid and how those deals work, well, there's different ways that get it done. And those different ways give different kinds of kind of recruitment experiences. So Mark kind of breaks down what it's like on that side of the table to give you a little bit more insight. We also get Mark's incredible experience on how to strategize to develop your career, what you should be doing to plan that five and 10 years in advance for your career. We talk about the process of going out and looking for a gig. And we also uh, talk about, you know, the importance of, of handling social media correctly in today's, you know, world where everything is online. And, you know, he also mentions some tips for LinkedIn and stuff like that. And finally, doing due diligence on the company you're going to work with. So, you know, getting a job is not just a one-way thing where you're applying and they're approving. It's really a two-way street. And you need to do your due diligence on that organization. And we talk a little bit about that, too. So a lot in this episode, especially for those of you who are thinking about managing your career over the next five, 10 years, you're going to get a lot out of this. With that, let's go to the interview with Mark. Mark, welcome to Playmakers. Great to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here today. You were just telling me how you've been in the industry 30 years. How many of those years have you been in the recruiting part of the business? You know, I started off as a game programmer 30 years ago. So I worked on some of the first games ever released in the North American market. And I'm not even going to mention the names at this point because you can look it up on uh, Wikipedia. And frankly, it ages me. So uh, yeah, so 10 years as a developer and then 20 years as a recruiter in the industry. Is that Falcom 1? Yes, it is actually. <laughs> cool. I, got, I got your Wikipedia page right here in front of me. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, things like that. So, hey, you know, it's the start of the uh, start of the games. So, you know, today when you look at a game, it's just so much more robust. So, thirty years in the industry, twenty years recruiting. You must have this down to a science. What is it that you wish people understood about recruiting and working with recruiters? Well, you know, I wish people understood that a recruiter is not a magic bullet and you can't have someone take away that job hunt, which I know is nauseating, uncomfortable, difficult. What other work can we throw at it? Emotional, you know. It just is not a fun experience. But unfortunately, the average person employed job hunts 17 times in their lifetime. Wow. Bummer. You're going to have to learn how to get good at job hunting. If you want to manage your career, you got to learn how to do the job hunting, which is really a, the reverse of networking. So, you know, people are either job hunting or networking. They never stop doing either or. And that's what I teach people how to do so that, uh, you know, when they have to job hunt those 17 times, you know, and if you're in the game industry, it's probably going to be 32 times. Totally. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Hey. <laughs> I mean, I, having done quite a few of these interviews, that's something I, I hear a lot. You know, oh, I was here for two years and then I was here for a year and then I was here for six months. And then usually, you know, at some point people sort of find a home uh, if they're lucky, but not everyone does. No, that's true. It can be quite a bit frustrating in our industry because we're high tech and high tech is unstable. 
So, uh, you know, so that creates a problem. You know, also, uh, you know, we started talking a little bit about this before. Also, there's just a different uh, mentality between East Coast employers, West Coast employers, employers in Europe, employers in Asia. There's just different mentalities. And, you know, once you understand that, that also kind of helps level out the career. You know, for example, the West Coast, let's not just hit California. It's the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Basically, the model for the last 10 years has been start a company, staff the company, sell the company. Well, I don't know where the profit is in this, but okay. So who cares about making profits? Just start a company, staff the company, and then offload it to somebody else. And that's been very successful. You know, uh, unfortunately, that's why people have jobs for three months, six months, one year. You know, you're just treated like a dime a dozen. Uh, uh, Who cares? There's no commitment to the employee. On the other hand, there are companies on the East Coast. (laughs) I mean, if you think about it, if all business in America operated this way, wow, America would be in a lot of trouble. (laughs) You know, there are companies on the East Coast. Someone's got to buy the companies. Yeah, right. But, you know, there's companies on the East Coast and the mid- and Midwest. I mean, you know, whatever, all over the country, really. Actually, a few on the West Coast as well, where they actually invest in their employees, that it's a commitment so that they know it's a five-year commitment or a lifetime commitment. And therefore, the whole interview process is different. So sometimes when I have a West Coast person wanting to go East Coast, I actually have to give them therapy because they really don't believe that the company is, like, investing in me. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it's kind of funny. So yeah, okay. I've been I've been at some companies where I felt really supported, and I've been at companies where I felt like you were you were being judged every every quarter. Right, exactly. So uh, and that's a not a fun environment to be in, and that's something you want to look at when you're job hunting and considering that. So so I just wish that people understood that there are two types of recruiters out there. Most of the recruiters they're dealing with are contingency recruiters, meaning their relationship is contingent, meaning Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, whoever is going to go to five contingent recruiters at the same time and say, hey, I need an art director. The first one who gets me the art director wins. Mm. Well, I don't know you, but that sounds like a cluster to me. And guess what? It is a cluster. Those five recruiting firms, they don't know anything about the game industry. They really don't have a relationship with the company. They're just talking to an email address and HR. So no relationship at all. And yet they're going to, then they're going to look at your resume. They're going to get a hold of your resume and they're just going to submit it because maybe it'll stick to the wall. You know what? Stay away from those contingency recruiters, for God's sakes. That is horrible. I just want to say that that Mark is pacing around his office right now, and it's yeah, it's kind I of am. fun to watch. Um, <laughs> and I guess, you know, from a content standpoint, let me just add that I think there are also companies whose own hiring manager process works this way. And that is also something to, to look out for. You know, I'm not talking about the internal recruiters that actually work for EA, Ubisoft, Sega, Sony. That's a different story. That's the company coming to you. But a third-party recruiter that's on contingency, I'm sorry, Bob. They're going to take your one resume. They're going to blast it out to thousands of game companies. Asia, can't, who cares if you'll move to Asia? They don't even ask you. They're going to send that generic resume out everywhere. So what they've done is they've gotten you blackballed and rejected out of the industry because now there's a $20,000 fee in your head and no one wants to pay it. And frankly, do you think a generic resume sent to everybody? That's like playing the lottery. That is not how you job hunt. You customize your approach to everybody that you approach. Otherwise, stop playing around. Go work at McDonald's. So so what you're saying, and, and I didn't realize this, some recruiters will send your, your resume out. And as soon as it's out in the hands of the hiring managers, then you are based, you can't yourself go to those hiring managers without them having to pay this additional fee. Correct. You are owned by that recruiter for 12 months. That's why you've got to be careful who you give your resume to. You've got to interview the recruiter on the telephone. If they cannot name names in the industry, if they can't talk the talk, that's how they're going to represent you if they even speak to somebody. See, I'm a retained recruiter. I am paid by my clients before I ever pick up that telephone. Why do they pay me? I'm a game programmer. I, I, I know the Unreal Engine. I've touched Unity. I can program. I've done game design. I've done marketing. Guess what? I understand the jobs I'm recruiting for. I'm not matching buzzwords. So there is no way I'm going to submit someone who's a marginal person to one of my clients when I'm working on a search. And everyone in the industry knows that. So I'm retained. So of course, you're going to trust someone who's, and it's just, come on. If you're either worth being paid to do the search or you're not, I say the five to 10 recruiters that get hired to fill the art director search aren't obviously worth an, a relationship with the company or they would actually have one. <laughs> right, 
Right. So, so yes, I'm talking to the hiring managers. I'm talking to HR. I'm talking to the, you know, the board of directors. It's a, it's a live, real conversation. I actually can prepare someone for the interview because guess what? I help them design the interview. <laughs> it's like, oh, <hello. laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't I wasn't aware that this was uh, that this was something I should be tuned into if I was looking for to, you know, if I was getting contacted by a recruiter, what are the questions I should ask? Are you a retained or contingent recruiter? Absolutely. That's the first question. Are you retained or contingent? And uh, they should be able to answer that question. Second question is basically, who is your client? You know what? I have no problem telling me when, I, when you, you, when I call you to recruit, I am recruiting for Sega. I'm on retainer. If you send your resume to Sega, they're going to send it to me for that job anyway because I'm on retainer. So when that recruiter doesn't want to tell you who the company name is, that already tells you contingency, contingency, no, stay away. And again, if they can't talk the talk, they can't talk the industry, they can't talk the games you've worked on, the games someone else has worked on, they call you on the phone, hi, are you a game designer? And you're like, no, I'm a programmer, Tard. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, from these yeah. people, these people are going to rep, they're not even repping you. They're just hoping that the company will hire you by mistake. And yeah, people win the lottery. This is not how your job went. Okay, so, that's yeah. that's great. Right. Something else I want to ask you about is about career management. So, okay, so, you know, dealing with a recruiter is something that happens from time to time. What about, you know, since since you've been working with, with people for 20 years, what are some of the things you've seen in terms of helping people manage their career longer term? Well, you know, you just got to strategize. And I know it's not easy to do. And we've all said it. But, you know, it's kind of like a New Year's resolution. You got to sit down and figure out, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> if, it is, if it is becoming a vice president or a CEO or running your own company, it just doesn't happen by magic. You've got to plan that out. And you've got to look at the experience base you've got today and say, OK, if I want to be a VP. I know I got to have this kind of skill set. And I, I got to develop myself up to that. So that's how you that you've got your five year plan, your ten year plan. It just doesn't happen, you know. The other day, <laughs> some of the younger folks, you know, they just I don't know, they just think they're going to be vice president after five days of working. And we and I did one of my clients called me up because they were like, "Oh my god, Mark, I just hired this associate producer, and he asked me if he was being fast tracked for executive manager." <laughs> and the hiring manager just didn't even know what to say. You know what I mean? It was like, uh, "What have you done yet?" <laughs> in the job you know so he had been uh, hired though yeah yeah so uh that was about that but we were all kind of laughing about <laughs> okay like like do something as associate producer first and you know before we talk about executive producer <laughs> <laughs> so uh so what was the, the question i always want to make sure sometimes i drift uh we were talking about career management sort of longer term strategy you mentioned five-year plan 10-year plan you know what do those plans look like well, you know, it's like break it down. You want to be a vice president of development. Obviously, you got to start off in some sort of production role, uh, move yourself up to some sort of senior level, management level role, jump into, you know, you just got to keep making sure that you're progressing in the company the right way so that you, so that when someone looks at your background, of course, you have the foundation to be a vice president. So, and that's what people need to, you know, need to think about and focus on. It's not like rocket science. It's pretty simple to figure that out. And just keep your eye on the ball every time you're doing a job change. Uh, and folks, you know, get excited and emotional during the job change. And they also don't run their job search. <laughs> a lot of people just answer job ads. And I'm always scratching my head going, really? You think that's job hunting? If that's what you think is job hunting, go back to school or go learn how to job hunt because that is not job hunting. There's only only 10% of the jobs are ever advertised. Really? You're going to swim in 10% of the jobs. Great. <laughs> that, that is a that is a red ocean. So Yeah. Okay, so so how do we job hunt? That's that's fantastic. Let's talk about that. What what is well, job hunting if it's not answering those ads? Job hunting is really doing my job. It's being a mini recruiter. You know, you're every day on the phone talking to people. Yes, you're sending out a resume. Ah, most likely you're sending out at this day and age, you know, people are going to, if they look at your resume, they're certainly going to get onto Google or in a search engine and then look you up on the internet. So you really got to make sure that your internet life is put in order. So what do I mean? LinkedIn page must be filled out appropriately with a business appropriate photo, showing a comic strip, showing any kind of other image, you know, I'm really glad to see your art in one snapshot, but no, that's not what the LinkedIn platform is about. It's a business-to-business -business connection, but mm -hmm. up a business picture. Mm -hmm. So 
LinkedIn, the LinkedIn profile needs to be filled out correctly because if it's not, it indicates you're lazy, you know? So immediately we're making higher decisions based on your LinkedIn profile. So figure out how to update that profile. Next thing to do is Facebook, dude. You got to lock down Facebook. If I don't know who you are and I can get on your Facebook page and I can see pictures of you smoking and drinking, no, no, no. I understand marijuana is being legalized across the country. It's still illegal and federal. And guess what? You're not going to be hired in the video game industry. I don't care how cool you think it is. And I've seen many people lose a job based on photographs on Facebook. I had a chick once. Oh, my God. It was a goodbye party at her old company. She took a new job. You know, they were just about to make her an offer. HR jumps on her web, on her Facebook page. They see her with all these guys. It was her goodbye party at a game company. So, of course, there's only, but it just didn't translate. And what did translate was something negative, and she did not get the job offer. So, I mean, really, you got to lock that Facebook page down. You don't know how to do it. YouTube. How do I lock down my Facebook page? Your friends should be able to see your stuff. Someone, If I'm not your friend, I should be able to see what you want me to see, one or two pictures that are professional. And of course, on Facebook, fill out your information like you did on LinkedIn and don't leave it incomplete. Incomplete stuff communicates that you are incomplete in your work. Why would I hire you when there's other people to talk to? So LinkedIn, Facebook, you want to do that. You also want to do a vanity search on your name using Google and then any other search engine, but another search engine besides Google. And you want to look at page one of hits. Most people don't have more than one page. And you want to make sure there's nothing on those hits that you don't like. Because if it is, it's time to figure out how to remove that off of the website so those hits don't show up anymore. Hmm. So it's about a little bit about cleaning up your internet life because we're going to jump on the internet immediately to research who the heck you are despite the resume that you send me or the LinkedIn profile you send me. You know, we're still going to do some internet. So uh, so people need to realize that that's something that's important to clean up immediately. Second thing is uh, you've got to uh, customize your resume and your approach to every company. I'm sorry, artists. You know, EA Sports does not want to see your sci-fi images. It's EA Sports. So don't approach them unless you can do sports images or you want to do sports images. So, you know, it's just very simple. So and a lot of people just don't get that. Oh, they're going to hire me because I can do, you know, whatever. And <laughs> if that's all you've got, then at least acknowledge it somehow in your writing. Yes. You know, so, so you know, you, you want to be focused. You want to be focused on... Uh, you know, what companies to approach uh, and what resume to give those companies. It's okay if your resume is a bit customized to somebody. It's just that the dates are weird and they don't match up to LinkedIn. You know what I mean? A customized resume is fine. It's just when the whole story doesn't come together in a consistent manner, it creates a, a level of distrust before the conversation even starts. So you want to get rid of that distrust level by just locking down everything and making sure it's the same story everywhere about you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, so that's about that. So, and then of course you want to advertise the on the unadvertised job market. That's where you job hunt. Eighty five percent of the jobs are unadvertised, and you obtain them through networking. All right. So, what do we do? Well, LinkedIn's a great tool for y'all. And uh, so, what do you do? You're an artist. You get on LinkedIn. You join the largest. You're allowed to have have fifty groups on LinkedIn when you have a free account. All right. So you start with those 50 groups. I would I, I chunk up 40 of them and keep 10 just for, you know, just for in case. And those 40 groups, you find the largest animation groups. You know, you don't want to join small groups. You want to join the largest groups possible in your area. Uh, and that will grow your LinkedIn profile tremendously and in the areas that you want to grow in. So that when you start to advertise yourself and approach people in these groups about job hunting and networking, guess what? These are people that know about jobs that are unadvertised. You know, you know what I'm saying? So it's just about yeah. starting it start starting that process. So that's how you start to get into the unadvertised job market. The other thing is to do is you make a list of the top 10 companies that you want to work for. I don't care what job ad is out there. Who do you want to work for? You know, I mean, this is about you. It's your career. And guess what? You'll be way more dynamic in the interview if it's a company that you're excited about. And then it's about researching who works at the company. Use LinkedIn again. Use other resources, Gamma Sutra, whatever. If someone's writing, you're in, art, in the art department, find the art director. Find people on staff who write articles. They're friendlies. You know, linked into these folks. You know, if you're a programmer, figure out who the VP of engineering is. Figure out who the technical director is. Link in with them. Start a conversation. Talk about stuff. Become someone who's known, not just a resume thrown over every once in a blue. 
you know, that's how things rock and roll. And that's how people start to get to know you. It's uh, that's what's what they mean by using your network. So now you're intelligently networking inside your target company. Okay, and then wait, you can... I, I want to talk about that a little, go a little bit more in depth. So, so you find someone on LinkedIn who works at the company you're interested in and you message them and you just, you would start a conversation about their art or asking a question about their work. Or how would you? Know, you... I always like to do that. I always like to start off. When people like to talk about themselves, and we're all kind of self motivated. So I always like to play on that. So when I'm introducing myself to someone, especially in a networking environment, I'm going to approach them. Hey, I loved your article on mm. VR. And you, and of course, it's authentic. I'm not lying. I really do like the article. You know, so that's why I say get on the internet and look for people who are writing articles, especially your target companies, because those are the friendlies inside. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't email the guy who wrote an article this month. I, I find articles I wrote two or three months ago because if they wrote it this month, they're getting inundated by a zillion different people. So find people that wrote articles two, three, four months ago from your target company. Start approaching those folks. They're most likely going to be friendlies. That is find a great them, tip. The, the, the older the, articles. Yeah, yeah. Find them through the International Game Developers Association if they're members that way. Figure out a way to uh, engage in a conversation. You see their Facebook page. They ski. You like skiing. They got a dog. You've got a dog. Figure out a way to start a conversation that's not, hey, can I get a job? You heard their yeah. interview on Playmakers podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> See, then you're starting a dialogue, and then every time you have new code, or every time you've done a new art image, or every time you've done something, you're sending out a little note. Hey, guys, here's a link to my demo. Check out my new thing. Who cares if they follow the link or not? What happens is in the art meeting, in the programmer meeting, when the VP says, hey, I need to hire a junior X, how about a mid-level Y? What about that guy is kind of coming in your head? You're going to bring up the person's name in the meeting because you've been networking and talking to this company. And bam, all of a sudden you're getting an email from the dude or the gal saying, hey, the job hasn't even been advertised. HR doesn't even have the rec signed. And they're already talking <laughs> to you about the job. That's called unadvertised jobs. And that's how you start the process. So it's about being smart, about figuring out what your goal is and how do you get to your goal. And, and being consistent. I think there's something very powerful about contacting someone and contacting them again in three months and again in three months and just keeping that channel open. Right. So the other trick is learn to use a database. There is no way as a human you can keep this all in your brain. And if you've heard me at the beginning, networking is the reverse of job hunting. So you're just not going to stop doing it. We just don't have the luxury of not doing that. So you're either networking to just meet people, you're going to throw them in your database, and you're still going to keep in touch with them, or you're networking to meet people that are going to hire you. But you're just always doing this process. You know, it's just a 24, 7, 36 day. <laughs> it's all the time, you know. And that's how you're never stuck without a job. That's how you're never really job hunting or having to put a resume together. We all hear about these people who have worked for 20 years and have never had a resume. Well, at least I do all the time. And it's because they had a network. Of course right. they don't need a resume. Because when that, you know, someone plucks them out of their, their current job when the time is right because they're always networking. So that's about that. So it's good. It's important to learn how to network as well when you're, when you're out in an environment like that. I mean, first of all, Mark, that was amazing. I'm a little passionate about the topic. I, I really love helping people out. I can tell. It comes through. It makes me cry when someone has spent four, six years getting a programming degree or a specialty degree to the game industry, and then no one has taught them how to do that first job hunt, which is a nightmare, let alone the second and third. But the first one really sucks. I mean, it's right out of college. You have no experience. It is really tough. And they give up after three months, and they're flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. That makes me so sad because you've mm. invested all this time to get that degree, to get the experience, to put together a, a demo and just failing at the job hunt. Come on. You know what I mean? Yeah. But schools teach this stuff, you know, and I get it. It's not fun. Uh, quick aside, what do you think? Are people hiring from those boot camp style programs that have become popular? Yeah, no. I mean, maybe some entry level kind of jobs. Sure. But really, it's the more traditional schools, you know, full sale real world education. What's it called? Full Sail University now. Yeah. Excellent program. DigiPen, excellent program. You know, uh, Texas A&M, excellent program. You know, you know the real programs that, that have the degrees. These, you know, two-year specialty colleges, eh, you know, it's a foundation to start, but you better do some work to back up that degree. Okay. You know? Okay. That's good to know. Guildhall, is the Guildhall program a good one? Yeah, Guildhall, excellent. That's what I meant by, you know, uh, Texas A&M or whatever, Guildhall. Right. Excellent, bro. Excellent, okay. excellent. Okay, great. 
So Gamma Sutra has a list of the top two or 300 schools, so you can find it on that website. Our hero has found her, her job. She's being offered a job. What are some of the things she should think about before taking the job that maybe people forget to do, especially if, the, if it's one of their 10 dream companies? Well, if it's your first job in the industry, just take it. Who cares? Mm. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I really, first job, you just need the experience and stay as long as you can at that company. It's the foundation of your career. And if you can move around, great. But really, the first job, I just said, keep your mouth shut, get it, just take it <laughs> and make it work. You know what I mean? It's the next oh, yeah. job. It's the next jobs afterwards. You know, the second, the third, the fourth job, that's when you can start to control where do I live in the country, you know, what's important to me in a company, but just not that first job. So, uh, and maybe the second job, depending on how long you stayed on the first job. But uh, until you're like year three or four in your career, you can't really start to manage it very well. You're sort of at the whim of whatever comes your way, you know what I mean, what you can create. Sure. Uh, then you can start to, to write the ship, you know, you, you're three and on. And that's when you want to start to consider company personality, uh, company funding. P you know, how many candidates don't look at what the funding is of the company? And I'm not even talking about, okay, this company raised $50 million. Great. Well, let's quickly do the burn rate. You know what I mean? Okay, they got 200 employees. Gee, your average employee is $60,000, which is a low salary. Okay, they got this building here. I mean, you don't have to have a PhD and know a lot about math to figure out, <laughs> okay, this company is going to survive for about three more months and then go out of business. So why would you join the company? It's just about some logical, you know, <laughs> I had a client a few years ago. They, of course, they went out of business. You know, I kept emailing the CEO. I started recruiting for them, and then the numbers just didn't make sense to me. So I started emailing the executive staff. Guys, uh, I'm just a, a third party, but I think you're going to burn out of money in, in about eight months. I'm not staffing you. You know what I mean? And no one could respond to me. And so, of course, I stopped staffing. And, of course, eight, about oh, a year later, 300 employees on the street. So, you know, it's just obvious, you know, and I walk from those clients. I'm not going to take a client that's going to put some of it on the street ASAP. That's ridiculous. I'm not here to cause headaches. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So people need to research the company, figure out. They also need to research the culture. If it's a wham, bam culture, like we're going to find in typical uh, startup entities in the Bay Area, hey, you might enjoy that when you're young. I don't enjoy that now, and most people don't enjoy that when they're trying to get married, when they're trying to have a family, when they're trying to put their kids through college, when they're trying to retire. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's when you start to look at quality of life and where you live in the country, you know, things like that. So, yeah. So, unfortunately, you just got to wait a few years into your career before you can start to direct it that way. Yeah. And that's the things you want to consider. You want to consider cost of living because you know what? 100K in Madison, Wisconsin might sound like no money to you. You're living high on the hog in Madison, Wisconsin. And you know what? That's the Berkeley of the Midwest. So while it doesn't have the best reputation, maybe, you check it out. You will never leave Madison, Wisconsin. You know what I mean? It's just those kind of decisions that people get to start to make when they're a little bit older. And I think they're great decisions, although I'm sure some of the younger folks are like, what? I'm not moving to Madison. I think, you know, this is already fantastic. There's so much information here. I think listeners may have to listen to this a couple of times to, to kind of get everything that you've said. Let's talk a little bit about the trends that are happening now. So what are some of the things that have changed, you know, in the last one to two years in terms of hiring? Well, what's changed, unfortunately, on the employer side is that they are uh, they can't get AAA talent anymore because, you know, what's happening is game industry talent is now wanted by every industry. We're talking. I had a client. They made bubble gum. What the heck do they need video game people for? But the Tops company and headquartered in New York City, yes, that 80-year-old company, set up a interactive division. And guess what? They hired a good 100 game industry folks. So and that's just an example of how Tops, any industry... T -O -P -P -S. T -O -P -P -S, yeah. Yeah. You know, they made the old bubblegum baseball cards when we were kids, or maybe you're too old, too young. <laughs> anyway. I think, uh, I think uh, what's his name? The, the old uh, head of Disney took, took them over. Uh, you know, Jeremy from EA was running out for a while. I don't know if you know him, but anyway, um, yeah, so everyone wants the talent now. So actually, which is a good thing for some of us, but also, hey, that uh, gives uh, the traditional game companies some competition. So we've got some companies right now who just don't get it. And they're still showing these disgusting salaries and like think that there's just a dime a dozen. And there are other companies uh, where their hire process is 10 days. 
they identify you and they make a yes or no decision in 10 days. And I'm telling you, that's companies like Google, that's Microsoft, that's, you know, that's EA, that's Ubisoft. They're making offers within 10 days. So is Activision. So that's what's happening these days. And the other folks that are just dragging along, you know, we're just in a crisis right now in the, in the, in the industry. Uh, there's not enough American talent to fill the needs of the game industry, let alone anyone who needs digital talent. So think about it, even the PR agencies are now creating virtual reality and augmented reality assets. They right. need artists in the game industry. So you see what I mean? So the talent pool is being pulled everywhere. So we no longer in the game industry can get away with underpaying. We can't get away. Overworking. Yeah. Yeah, overworking, and we've got to make a higher decision within 10 days. We can't just fluff around anymore uh, like we've done in the past. So some companies get it and some companies aren't. So, all right. That's that fine actually with me. sounds very positive to me because I think it's that pressure that will make make companies change and make the industry change. One of the things that, and you may know the stats on this, but something that's always bothered me is, is I think, I believe about 50% of the people who break into the game industry leave within five years. Yeah, you know, that's a, it, there definitely is a high percentage. I just don't know the number. Yeah, at this point. It's something high. I've heard that bandied about, but it, it's something high. And and I think it's it's a shame because I think it, it means the games aren't as good. You know, I think it means our impact culturally isn't as high. And I think this is all part of it. So so hopefully we're on a path to to better games and a bigger impact in the world. And, you know, companies need to get more aggressive. Like uh, I'm finding, too, that, you know, I had a company come to me for a very special job. And frankly, everyone in the, country, in the world wants this, this position. It's the hardest position to fill. So and they're in bum nowhere. I mean, oh, my God, big deal. You got one or two games. You know what I'm saying? And they want to hire AAA talent. Bull, bull. I show them this guy working at EA for 10 years. Do you think EA is paying this guy for 10 years because the person sucks at their job? This company would not look at the person without a demo. And I'm just like, wake up. It is 2017. We do not have this time. EA is not employing this person for all these years. I mean, come on. Where's the sense? I get it if it's an entry-level person, but someone with 10-plus years experience, seriously, you're going to give them a programming test? You're going to insult them like that? You're going to insult them with an art test? Seriously. <laughs> and so that kind of baby stuff has got to go. But that's all there because the people in the human resource department are not from the game industry. They barely know how to use their computers, and they're not playing video games. So, of course, if it's not exactly written on the resume the right way, they have no clue. You know what I mean? So, and that's another problem that we see in the industry is that game companies, because other companies do invest in quality HR folks, game companies, they'll hire someone, they were an assistant recruiter for two months at a game company, and all of a sudden now they're running HR at another game company. No background, no qualifications, hardly know what they're doing, certainly don't know what an artist does, certainly have never seen Maya on the screen. I mean, I don't get it. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, you are the quality of the people you can retain and hire. A, a people make A games. C people make C games. It's quite simple. So why companies uh, would allow a 18-year-old to run their human resource department? Clueless. And those are the companies I stay away from. And you should too. Right. I mean, I, I think that would that would potentially be be uh, challenging for a lot of people going to to meet with that recruit with that person. <laughs> But that's sort of like what I was saying earlier. You were talking about, you know, what kinds of recruiters to look out for. And I was saying there are also hiring managers that that I yes. think people need to be looking out for as well. Yeah. The other frustration I get to is, you know, uh, hiring managers and companies, they do not know how to interview. Most people have not taken a class on interviewing. They have not uh, even opened a book. So they try to go by what feels good. Really? What feels good? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not dumb. I'm going to show up in an interview, and my interview performance, my my Mark Mensher interview show, is going to be two hours perfectly crafted. Of course, you're going to hire me. You might not like me, but I'm a smart interview person. I'm going to put on a good show. It's not about a feeling. It's not about, you know, it's really about learning how to do behavioral interview techniques and getting into, can this person perform the job? So I get so frustrated that people just do not know how to evaluate skills. You know, what are you going to do? Well, that gets back to the HR department as well, because, you know, someone's got to train the teams to bring the right people on. Correct. But, you know, again, when you've got someone who's not qualified running HR, running around trying to just figure out how to establish it, the last thing they can do is proactively train their management staff 
<laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> When's that going to happen? Well, that's what we've got you for, Mark. So, so give us give us some some tips uh, for hiring managers or for for other leads who are you know who are playing a part in the process. You know, it's called behavioral interview techniques. You can you know throw it into Google and bam, up will come a ton of articles about it. It's really just a technique of asking questions and de- 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 digging deeper and deeper and deeper into a project or an experience that the employee had, because in that they reveal to you who they are, how they are, how they showed up, their attitude. You know what I mean? It's really hard to fake it when you start to drill into an example that someone gives you. So behavioral interviewing style teaches you how to do that, and it's quite effective. You know, so uh, so that's what I encourage folks to learn how to do. Well, that's fantastic. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what seems like a rise in contract workers and also in kind of um, putting together bespoke teams on a project to project basis. Um, how are you seeing that increase and, and what are your thoughts on it? You know, we talk about this a lot. We've talked about this a lot in the industry for the last 20 years. And we've all expected it to increase sort of like it has happened in the film industry. But, you know, it's contract works going on, obviously, but it's really not increased to the way we all projected. And I think part of that is because uh, we're working on a confidential game. We don't want people to know what that game is until we're ready to release it. So really, I'm going to hire contractors that I don't really have control with all across the world, and I'm expecting them to keep their pie holes shut. Uh, so I think that's really why uh, contracting has not been the best. All the other problems is, you know, Asian cultural differences. You know, you're making a game for the Western market. You know, you contract out to artists in Asia. Really, they've got Asian sensibilities. Nothing wrong with it. it just doesn't play in the Western market. Bomb of a game. You know what I mean? So that's why contracting just mm, doesn't exactly work out, you know. Yeah, and it's been slow to, uh, you know, it's, it's been slow. It's not the what I thought it would be, you know, 20 years into recruiting in this industry. Anything else that uh, you want our listeners to know about or where they can reach you? You know, um, they can always reach me at mark, M-A-R-C, at gamerecruiter.com. I will respond to emails, but as you can imagine, my inbox is uh, a little bit uncontrollable. So sometimes it does take a good week, but I always respond. So I do apologize for that. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions for folks, put them on the right path if they get stuck on something. But normally, you know, when I'm recruiting for the jobs that I'm working on, I'm like an extension of uh, the company's HR department, and I'm working on their emergency searches or I'm working on searches that they don't want the industry to know about. So like if EA, I always pick on EA, I'm sorry, one of the big companies, they need a new director of technology. Do you think they want their board, their stockholders to know that? Do you think they want their competitors to know that their tech director's out the door? No. So that's when they come to someone like me. So I get it done and replaced on the QT. So if you don't see jobs posted on my board, that's probably because I just can't talk about them. Email me anyway. Let me know you exist. I'll reach out to you. Uh, when I have a job that fits in the world, uh, you know, the realm of someone's uh, reality, you know? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, the amount of information we have stuffed into the last 35 or so minutes is amazing. So I really appreciate your time, Mark. No problem. It was a lot of fun. And I hope your audience enjoyed it. Me too. Talk soon. Take care. Boom. That was the interview with Mark Mencher. That is episode 15 of Playmakers in the can, which is amazing to think that we've already done that many episodes. Thank you so much for being a part of this, for listening, for subscribing, for writing reviews. It means a lot. It really does help keep the show going, and I want to keep it going a long time. So please be a part of that and, you know, write us a review. It means so much to me. And if you want to reach out to me personally, you can do so, jordan at brightblack.co. There's no M on that. It's just .co. Jordan at brightblack.co. Send me an email. Let me know who you'd like on the show, what topics you want covered, what struggles you're having in your work, in your career, in your project. And I'm here to help bring on the guests who get it done for you. So that's it for this week's episode. Thanks again to Mark, who is amazing. Like I mentioned, I think it would be great to talk to him focused on the studio side as well in a future interview. I will have to ask him about that. But in the meantime, have a great week. And I will see you on the next episode of Playmakers.